Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. Today I have an interesting experiment lined up for you guys. I've been browsing through SparkFun Electronics online catalog and I came across a couple of components and I thought it'd be cool to use them outside of what they were designed for, to do something with them that they were not intended for. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the components that I found and SparkFun kindly has sent those to me and I will demo them, I'll tell you a little bit about them and how they work then I will do a bit of theory to kind of cover the background of what I'm about to do next and then we will set up this um, elaborate experiment using these components and there's a lot of learning process, a lot of interesting things that happen so then I'll demo the whole thing with, for you and then I will make all the code that's uh, required to program the microcontrollers and to use for MATLAB I'll make them all available online as well so you can repeat this experiment for yourself and the components are not expensive at all so you should be able to easily replicate that but then just bear with me through the theory so you can understand the principle of operation behind the experiment and then we will do the, the neat experiment at the end so let's get started so this is the first component that I wanted to show you it's a product called blink M basically what it does is that it has a tricolor LED in the front and it has an I squared C interface so you can send I squared C commands to it and the commands will be interpreted with the microcontroller in the back and then you will get any color that you want uh, coming out of here. If you look carefully inside this RGB LED you can see that it has three pieces of semiconductor in there. One for each wavelength, one for each color. That would be red, green and blue. So by turning the RGB components of this LED on and off at a certain rate with a different intensity then you are able to produce pretty much any color uh, visually coming out of this little LED. The nice thing about this particular component is that all you need to connect to it is power plus or minus 5 volts and an I2C interface, a two-wire interface. And from that, you can send this 24-bit commands and be, be able to get 24 bits worth of uh, resolution of color coming out of this LED. The design is really simple. It just has one microcontroller in the back and it has a bunch of LEDs to limit the current, uh, a bunch of resistors to limit the color, current to the LED. And then uh, that's about it. So it's really easy to use and what people use these for is maybe um, some decorative lighting or uh, some kind of uh, indicator uh, so to be able to produce uh, any color that you want. The, this thing also has built-in scripts so you can uh, send it a bunch of uh, macros essentially and tell it uh, do a certain color in the sequence. You can program it to do all kind of interesting things with the built-in firmware. It's a relatively inexpensive component, uh, nice and compact, you can see the, compared to the size of my hand. So and then uh, it works quite well. So of course I wanted to use it not for what usually people use it for. So I want to use it for data communication. So we'll get into that a little bit later. So now that we know this is the first component of our system. So uh, let me move on to the next one. This is our second component and this is an RGB color sensor. So what it does is that it tells you the intensity of each of those wavelengths when they enter this little uh, photodiode in the front. The way this component works is that inside this photodiode in the front of, front of it, there are three types of filters, actual optical filters in the red, green, and blue wavelength. So the light enters the front of the sensor, goes through the filter, and then it hits a particular photo detector, and the photo detector generates a current, and the current is then turned into a voltage with a transient pin amplifier, and it comes out of each of the pins in the back. So the nice thing about this component is, again, it's very easy to use. All you need to do is to give this guy 5 volts and uh, set the gain of each of the colors. You can just set them with a the digital value. And then from here, you can see there is a VR, VG, and VB. And the voltage that comes out of that tells you the intensity of each of those wavelengths when they enter the sensor in the front. The nice thing about this uh, little module is also that it has in the front a, a white LED that they have placed there. So what this white LED is meant to do is that when it turns on, it emits all wavelengths simultaneously. So if you hold this against the surface, let's say the brown surface of this table, the white LED light will come out, it will bounce against this uh, brown surface and the reflection will then represent the color of the surface and the reflection will then be picked up by this uh, photo detector in the front, convert it to a voltage, and if you connect this to an analog to digital converter, you can detect the color of uh, anything that, uh, your, that this faces to. So you may have used something like this if you, uh, let's say, go to Home Depot and you're trying to pick a particular paint for your wall, you can take a sample, hold it in front of the sensor, and it will tell you what color your sample is and it will make some paint for you. So it's a similar 
type of technology. But what Sparkfun has done is that it's put into a nice package, giving you the white LED in the front, so you can turn it on and off, all from a microcontroller, a nice standalone unit. So now you can see, kind of get an idea of what I want to do, is that I have here uh, the previous component, an RGB um, LED that will generate particular intensity of different wavelengths, and I will I can then get light from this and put it inside this and create an actual data transmission link, which is very different from what normally people use this for. But in order to do something like that, I need some more components. So let me show you the rest of this stuff. So in order to communicate with these, those two components, I need some kind of a microcontroller. So I usually use PIC microcontrollers, and I picked up this again from SparkFun. And uh, again, a very nice little compact uh, development board here where uh, it has a PIC 18F4550 at the heart of it, which actually has a USB interface, so really you can do USB, uh, kind of different kind of USB experiments with this. But really it's very simple, besides the microcontroller has a little crystal, and one LED that's connected to one of the pins on the microcontroller, you can enable and disable that with a jumper. There's one push button that you can use as an external input, the rest of the circuit is just for DC, basically. You can uh, power this board from an external AC or DC source, which goes through a diode bridge, through a 5-volt regulator, and some uh, decoupling cap to filter it out. And it has a little interface in the front that you can connect to an IC, ICC SP type programmer. So if you can either have a microchip programmer or some off-the-shelf programmer, third-party programmer, you can easily program this uh, microcontroller to do what you want. So I have two of these, I will use one for the transmitter, so one of them will control the RGB LED, the transmitter, and the other one will control the color sensor or the photo detector, which is our receiver. Aside from that, I'm also going to use uh, a USB to RS-232 converter, I actually have that here, this one, uh, also from SparkFun, very nice FTDI module uh, in the front, you just connect it to the USB, it'll be recognized as a COM port, then you can send RS-232 data coming out of it. So I will talk to these microcontrollers, two of them, using the PC through the RS-232 uh, interface, and I can do what I want. So what I want to do is to create a link between these two modules. I want to basically do a fiber optic experiment, but a very unusual fiber optic experiment. I want to take the light from this, and I want to put it through a fiber, then I want to receive it on the other end with this guy and be able to create an RS-232 replacement. Although it's not so fast, but it demonstrates the concept quite nicely. So before I do that, I want to show you a little bit of theory about data communication and how people usually do this type of links. So how do people usually do data transmission? Let's not worry about the bottom portion of this graph for a moment and let's look at this very simple example. This is what most of you are familiar with. You want to send a zero, you send a zero volt, you want to send a one, let's say you send a one. In this case, let's say 3.3 .3 volt. So if you want to send a zero, one, zero, you just create a little square wave like, uh, like that and, and the data is done. And this is what I showed you in one of the previous videos when we did about filters and data transmission. This type of data transmission is called NRZ or non-return to zero. Sometimes people also call it 2PAM because it means that the pulse amplitude modulation has only two levels. It either has a level down here, zero volts for example, or the level up there, 3.3 volts. So by sending a zero or by sending a one, you can easily do um, a, a data communication link and RS-232 for example works like that. If I were to plot this slightly differently to represent what kind of levels I have, I can plot it in something like this that looks that, that is called a constellation diagram. Now this doesn't look much like a constellation because it only has two points in it. The first point represents bit zero, which is kind of like zero volts, and the second one, which is bit one, in this case I've labeled as 3.3 volts. So when you send data, you're jumping between these two points on the constellation. So this is a symbol representation in the time domain, this is a constellation representation of the same thing. You can also represent this in the frequency domain, which I showed you in the, in the previous video. So here, if I want to send more bits, I have to send more of these pulses per second. So if, I, if each of these is one of my symbols, I want to send more data, I have to send more symbols per second. And we learned from last time that sending more symbols per second gets more and more difficult because you need more and more bandwidth, that which, not, which you may not necessarily have. Well, 
there is no reason why I'm limited to sending my data only between 0 and 3.3 volts. I can do something like this. I can say if it's 0, that represents 0, 0, so 2 bits per symbol. If it's 1.1 volt, that's 0, 1. If it's 2.2 volts, that's 1, 0. And if it's 3.3 volts, that's 1, 1. So now, every time I send a symbol, which is one of these guys, I'm not sending just one bit, I'm sending two bits. So what I've done is that I've broken this up into four levels as opposed to only two levels. So now I can send more bits per symbol. Before I had one bit per symbol, now I have two bits per symbol. So this type of data communication, this type of symbol waveform shaping is called four pan. So because it's four pulse amplitude modulation has four levels. Now I can plot the same thing on the constellation diagram down here. Now I have one, two, three, four points. So four possible combination or two bits, zero, zero, all the way to one, one. And you can see it's beginning to look a little bit more like a constellation because it has more points in it. So, well, if I can just pack more and more data into my symbols by adding more levels, why not do that you know, a thousand times, why not create a thousand different levels? Then every time I want to send a bunch of data, I only need to send one symbol. So in order to get the same bit rate, this guy has to have only half the symbol rate. So it's so much better for bandwidth. So why doesn't everybody do that? Well, the reason is because there is another element in here that we're ignoring and that other element is noise. So let me get a pencil. So let's look at the effect of noise on the first signal. Well, noise is, a, is in the time domain, so it will sit on top of this guy. So you have some noise here, and then I will have some noise here, and similarly some noise here. Well, it's not such a big deal here because the levels are so far apart that even if I have some noise, I can easily tell where a 1 was, and I can easily tell when a 0 was. The only way I would ever be confused between a 1 and a 0 is if the noise is so large that it will come across the threshold and back. Then I actually may get confused because then the receiver doesn't know was it 1 cent or was it 0 cent. So you can see it in the constellation diagram, the noise will crowd this circle around it and it will crowd this circle around it. So this is an ambiguity region, and this is an ambiguity region. But as long as they don't cross each other, you can easily tell what the zero was, and you can easily tell what the one was. But for the same amount of noise on this signal, now I'm a lot more susceptible into actually making mistakes, because my levels are so much closer to each other. So now if I do the same thing here on the constellation diagram, this is my, let's say, ambiguity region. And then this one is my ambiguity region, and this one is this guy, and this one is this guy. Every time these two cross each other, you're going to make a mistake. You don't know which of these two was sent. So sure, I'm saving bandwidth, but I'm more sensitive to noise. Here, I'm less sensitive to noise, but I need more bandwidth. Of course, there is never a free lunch. You can never win two things at the same time. So which one do you choose? just between, for example, these two? Well, it's not such an easy question to answer. There are other variables in play to decide what to do. But at least you have an idea of what the trade-off between these two type of signals is. Also, we, there is no reason why we should be limited to only one dimension like that. We can even do more fancy signaling. So let's look at something down here. So here on the right side, I'm showing something called quadrature amplitude modulation, which is something that is used mostly in wireless circuit, but that's not limited only to that. So here I'm sending 16 points in the constellation. It's not so easy to draw, draw this in the, in the uh, time domain anymore, but I'm doing it in the quadrature and in phase components. I will leave the detail of this type of experiment for a different video when I want to do a wireless experiment for you, then, then we will look a little bit more into this. But what you need to see here is that how many points are on this constellation. Now every time I set a symbol, each of these is a symbol, I can send four bits, zero, 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 zero up here, and then one, 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 one down there, and everything in between. So this guy needs even less bandwidth to send the same amount of bit rate. So to sum up what I was saying was that bit rate is equal to how many symbols per second you send times how many bits per symbol you have. So for example, for this guy, which was a 2 pam, just a regular one, we have one bit per symbol. So our data rate is just equal to our symbol rate because bits per symbol is one. Here, our bits per symbol is two 
and therefore whatever symbol per second I send, I can multiply it by two. So to uh, and what is the trade-off? As I said before, if you increase your symbol per, per second, you're making more difficult bandwidth requirements. If you increase your bits per symbol, you're more susceptible to noise. So what I wanted to do in the video, in our video, is that well, I have R, G, and B. So that's red, green, and blue. So I have three wavelengths. I can send a 4 pam or even an 8 pam, 8 levels per wavelength and I can send them simultaneously. So I can encode my digital data in the intensity of light in each of the wavelengths simultaneously. That will give me a three dimensional constellation because I have, it, I have one of these guys except having only four I will have eight dots so I will send three bits in the red three bits in the blue and three bits in the green all simultaneously through the same fiber using the RGB LED and I will receive it using the color sensor and I will show you a block diagram of our system because it is a little bit confusing so I will send RGB data from this and I will receive it from this and I can create a fiber optic length that has a constellation that is not two-dimensional but three-dimensional then I'm going to use MATLAB to plot the three-dimensional constellation depending on the color I'm receiving. Okay, so just a little bit more theory, I promise, then we will get back to the experiments. So, what, I, what have I built here? I have a PC that talks to my microcontroller. This is the guy I showed it to you a little bit earlier, through RS-232. The microcontroller then decodes the data for me and then sends it as an I squared C command into this blink -M. You can see the picture of that. So what the blink -M will do is that it will generate a particular color. That color is made of three wavelengths, red, green, and blue. Each of those will have a PWM on them. So the way the Blinkem creates different colors is by creating different PWM uh, signals onto each of the LEDs. And there was a PWM video that I did earlier, so you can look a little bit about how uh, PWM works. So it will send, for example, a PWM like this with a 50% duty cycle, something like this with, let's say, 10%, and something like this with 25%. So this will be a particular color. Let's say it will be um, somewhat pink. Then it will go through this fiber. I will show you the fiber. Then it reaches the color sensor, which is this guy I showed you. The color sensor will then receive that PWM signal and then give it right back to me in the same way it has received it because it will interpret them as intensity of light. But this PWM signal is a little bit difficult to receive. I want to convert that to an analog signal. And by doing an RC filter, I've done a tube-hole RC filter, you can filter the PWM signal and turn it back into a multi-level analog signal. Now I have something like this that looks like an 8-pamp signal. The 8-pamp signals will then go through ADCs built into the microcontroller on a similar board, and then that guy gives it back to me in the form of RS-232. So how many bits am I going to use? I'm using three bits in the red, three bits in the green, three bits in the blue. That makes nine bits. Every byte is eight bits, so I'm using the last bit as a parity to check to make sure there were no errors made. I don't want to go into too much detail, but the code, the MATLAB code, the microcontroller code, both for the transmitter and the receiver, and everything you see here, including this slide, I have made available on the website. So you can look at it and investigate it a little bit further just not to bore you. The only thing you need to know right now is that I'm sending different colors, I'm receiving different colors, and I'm encoding my information in the color itself. So every color will represent a different data. So then I can send a whole bunch of things and I can receive them and have an actual RS-232. So from the perspective of the PC, the PC sends RS-232 data, receives RS-232 data, and everything in the middle is invisible to the PC. So it's a full link and uh, uh, very, I, I thought it was pretty cool. It took a long time to get it to work. There's a lot of detail in the background which I'm not talking about, but maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that during the experiment. So normally fiber optic that is used in commercial communication is extremely thin. It's thinner than a human hair. But the fiber optic I'm going to use is made of thousands of fiber strands all bunched up together, and it's inside this uh, rather thick cable. This cable is used to transfer light to a microscope. So one side of it, uh, usually this side, goes into a light source and then this side goes into a microscope from the top so you can shine light onto whatever you're looking at. This is nice because it allows me to send a lot of light through it simultaneously, making the whole experiment a little bit 
simpler. So just to show you, um, for example, how this works, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on a little LED here, and I'm going to hold one of them in front of the LED so you can see the light coming through it. You can see how it gets uh, a little bit red. That is, uh, I'm holding it in front of some red light. If I hold it in front of, let's say, some blue light, then uh, blue light will come out of it. So the, it's, it's really easy to use. What I'm going to do is I have a different, slightly different one. I'm going to hold this in front of the LED. So let me show you what the setup looks like. So here's the entire transmitter. It's very simple. It uses the microcontroller development board I showed you before and some code that I have written in it. So this guy is connected to the PC using the FTDI uh, USB to RS-232 converter, so this goes to the computer and then RS-232 goes into the microcontroller, the microcontroller then interprets what data I want to send, translates that into a particular color, sends that information through I2C into the Blinkem module with the LED pointing into the fiber optic cable. So from the diagram we saw before, this is essentially this entire portion right here and then the fiber goes on. So the fiber is then taken from this side, goes around a little bit and goes across the table all the way to the other side to the receiver. And the only other thing I have is that I've connected the, my, uh, the development board directly into my Azure power supply there so I can power it on. Now if I were to follow the fiber to the receiver, I can carry the camera with me. The fiber goes on, comes along this way and reaches the receiver, which is uh, considerably more complicated in order to get it to work. So let's look at this slide a little bit more in detail. So here's the end of the fiber, right here. It comes and the fiber has a bend in it and it directly shines light onto the photo detector. So if I were to zoom in a little bit, right here, this is the end of the fiber and it's shining, it's going to shine light directly onto my photo detector. The photo detector signal is then taken out, fed into this chip right here, which is just a bunch of inverters just to clean up the signal a little bit. And then the output of the, 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 the um, filter, the output of the inverters, this guy, comes out of three wires, the red one, the green one, and the blue one. So here I have R, G, and B. And those signals represent, if I can find my piece of paper again, Those two, three signals represent the signals right here. So my RGB are these signals coming out of the photo detector and they go through the RC filter. And here are my RC filters, really simple two pole RC filter. Here's the one for the red, one for the green and one for the blue. So now I have analog signals as I have shown in this diagram. So here's my PWM RC filter. So now I have these analog signals and these analog signals can directly go through the microcontroller on another development board. So they come out, they go this way to these, again, R, G, and B cables. They go inside my microcontroller right here. And the microcontroller then again is connected similarly through another RS-232 to USB converter, and it goes back to the PC. So I have the same PC looking at the transmitter and looking at the receiver. Now what's important to note here is that the entire transmission of data and the receiving of data, the decoding of data and reassembling it back into a pipe, into a byte, is all done inside the microcontroller. The computer simply displays the result. All the calculations are done inside the microcontrollers. I am also connecting all of the outputs at the same time to my probes so we can look at the whole thing on the Regal um, oscilloscope. So I will turn this on. I will also power on my uh, my Regal power supply here, which I'm using for the transmit for the receiver. I'll wait for that to power up. Setting to 12 volts and turning that on. Reset this guy. So I've programmed uh, the receiver to blink the white LED to let me know that it is ready to receive a signal. So right now it's ready to receive a signal. I'm going to have to go to the transmitter and turn the transmitter on and then fire up the program on the computer. So let me do that first. So here we are again back at the transmitter. I've turned some lights off to make the room a little bit darker, easier to see the light. 
Now I have programmed the transmitter to have a few different modes. The one mode is to just cycle between red, green and blue so we can calibrate the system. Then there is a mode to send data as you enter on the keyboard and there is another mode to send random data so you can build a constellation. So first I'm going to turn on the first mode which is uh, to cycle through the colors. So you can see here that the uh, RGB LED is going through three different colors, red, green, and blue, and that allows me to, uh, to calibrate the receiver. So if I move back to the receiver, follow the fiber optic cable, and arrive at the receiver, turn this light off, you can see that the fiber is shining light onto, it's having a little bit of time difficulty too, focus here you go you can see the light is coming out of the fiber and being focused directly onto the RGB it's so bright that it saturates the camera because it cannot, doesn't have enough dynamic range but you can see the colors and if I look at the oscilloscope I can see on the oscilloscope that I have I'm receiving the uh, red green and blue signals at full intensity so a full waveform and if I'm Getting that, I've already calibrated the system, so it's receiving the signal as I expect. Now what I can do is I can go to the transmitter again and enter completely random data onto this. So I'm going to focus back on here. This was just R, G, and B. Now I'm going to go to the transmitter and I'm going to enable random data. Here we go. This is random data. So all kind of different light colors are shining so it's generating a whole different every time you see a kind of change in color it's sending a new symbol now because I have RC filters and I'm limited by speed I can only send two symbols per second which is 16 bits per second which is hopelessly slow of course but it demonstrates the concept so if I look if you look here now on the oscilloscope you can get a better idea of what's happening so a lot of things are happening so let me explain you can see each of these waveforms has three components, a red, a green, and a blue. So you can see that they show up at different amplitudes. Like I told you before, they're doing pulse amplitude modulation per wavelength. So every time you see one something like that, that's one symbol. And that encodes in it a total of nine bits of information. But there's something I haven't said anything about. There is no connection between the receiver here and the transmitter except the fiber that runs in between them. So how does the receiver know when a new symbol arrives? It has no way of knowing because its own crystal is slightly different in frequency than the crystal of the other board. So I have to find a way to extract the clock from the symbol. I need to know when to look at the data. So I do that by a very simple method by sending an initialization symbol every time I send a new symbol. So every time I send a new symbol, which are these ones, I send a complete zero symbol to synchronize the transmitter with the receiver. This yellow line square wave that you see here, that's the recovered clock from the receiver. So the recovered clock is this, because you can see every time this guy goes to zero, the, the receiver now knows a new symbol is about to arrive and it prepares itself for the new symbol right here. And it samples the new symbol at the rising edge of the clock. So again, there's a lot of detail that I'm not going into, but you can look at the code and figure out how this is done. But it's really nice to see what we were talking about in PWM right here in front of you. You can see how nicely that every time a new symbol is sent, the symbols are completely random. So every time a new symbol is sent, you get three different amplitudes of signal coming through. Okay, so we're back at the computer. I am going to open two terminals, one for the transmitter and one for the receiver. I have them right up here. So on the left side, I have the transmitter, and on the right side, I have the receiver. So I will reset the transmitter. And then the transmitter responds saying the transmitter started, enter command. So I'm going to enter the command D, which means for data. So now it says enter data. Now I can type at the keyboard and see the data on the other side. So I'm also going to put the other side, uh, the receiver, in data mode. Then I'm going to start typing something at the transmitter. And then the transmitter will translate that into color, the color will go through the fiber, the receiver will detect the color, translate it back into data, and give it back. So I'm going to type hi. Here's one H. You can see the H appearing here and the H appearing there. 
Of course, I cannot type very, very slowly because I am, can only send two uh, symbols per second. And out of those two symbols, one of them is to do clock recovery. So basically, I can only send one byte per second of data, which is very slow. But anyhow, that's, uh, that's the best you could get from these components. So I'm going to, uh, you know, for example, I can type numbers, one, two, three, four, and you can see them appearing on the other side. Now, this is not so exciting. What would be more exciting is to send random data and look on the other side and plot the constellation of the random data. So I can do that as well. I'm going to go back. This time I'm going to launch uh, MATLAB. First, I'm going to reset the transmitter, put the transmitter into random data so it's now generating random data you can see some weird characters it's working on that minimize this and i'm going to disconnect the serial port from there okay so now i have matlab code running again i don't have to worry so much about what the matlab code is doing the only thing we're interested in is actually seeing the constellation so let me reset the receiver okay we say the receiver, and now I'm going to run the command first to establish a serial communication. I hope this comes out well in video. I, I can see some strange color effect from my monitor. So it takes a little bit of time to establish a serial connection for some reason. And then I will plot the constellation. Here we go. So let's look and see what it is that we're seeing here. And bring it more to the center. So larger. So it's building automatically a three-dimensional constellation, where each dot is the color of the color that's being transmitted. So you can see all different colors building into this three-dimensional cube. So the more da random data it transmits, the more points will be filled inside the constellation. And when we are now, I'm going to wait a little bit until more and more points are, are, are collected. But I'll explain to you, I can't get this to focus right. I'll explain to you what this is. So this axis on this side is the axis for the color green. This axis is the axis for the color red. And the Z axis, axis going vertically up, is for the color blue. So every time a, a particular color combination is sent and the receiver detects that color it puts a point in the constellation now you can see how this constellation is so much more complex than the constellation I showed earlier if you remember this constellation this constellation has only uh, 16 points in it whereas this constellation here has 8 times 8 times 8 512 points in the constellation and every one of those points represents nine bits of data. If I let this run for a long time, it will be points everywhere in the constellation, and then you'll have a three-dimensional view. Now, one other thing that I want to point out here is that even though these points look like they are just individual points, they're actually a cloud of points because they depends on it make every time it makes a measurement and it sees the same symbol, it's not going to be at the same value because there's electrical noise, there's interferences. So each of them is a fuzzy region, like I was mentioning here. Each of them is a fuzzy region uh, where there, there's noise around the constellation point that you want. Except that here the data rate is so slow, it takes a very long time to actually build this constellation to a point where you can, uh, to, you can see it. Now, I will rotate it afterwards so you can see it in two, two dimensions when the points collapse together. I'm just going to wait a little bit until some more points are built. All right, I give it a little bit more time to build more points. Now I can rotate this plot and you can see the, all the points that are in the constellation. Now it's really hard to tell that these guys are actually organized in any meaningful way. But if I collapse the 3D plot into a two-dimensional plot by looking at it from the side, you can see that there is indeed organization in the points. We can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight levels of amplitude modulation in each direction of the colors. So here's in the green direction, here's in the red direction, and the type is the blue. So if I rotate it from the other side, you can see that in, indeed there are points in each direction. And that makes a three-dimensional constellation, three wavelengths. So if I were to call this, I would say it is a three-dimensional 
wavelength division multiplexing optical link which is basically what this is a so three wavelengths simultaneously eight level in each direction so eight pam um, uh, wavelength division multiplexing in three wavelengths so it's pretty complicated and it is a pretty sophisticated concept which can be applied to high-speed circuits and signals of course but here I demonstrate the idea we are using components that were not meant to do this at all but gives a very interesting result and this, this code to do all of this uh, and the slide presentation and everything is going to be available for free of course on the website just download it and play around with it and see what you can do you can, maybe you can even replicate this or uh, do it yourself now I'm using an RC filter if you remember but you guys can suggest other types of filter I've experimented with some active filters I just didn't have enough time to build it so maybe you can discuss that in the comment section and let me know what you think well I hope you enjoyed this particular experiment um, it took a long time to set it up even though it looks not that complicated it's just hard to get these things to work together but I hope that the learning experience was worth it uh, please leave some comment or suggestions or uh, rate the videos that helps other people uh, be able to watch them and come across them as well and uh, if you like to see a different type of experiment, if you thought this was too much detail or not enough detail, let me know so I can adjust it for the future videos. So, see you next time.